Now, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> As Peter said, I'm from DIT, and we have a school of retail in DIT. And as such, um, I'm kind of more independent, which means I can draw from um, all different types of sources, and I'm not really advertising or pushing uh, any type of uh, retailer or technologies or whatever here today. So I'm just going to look at uh, what's happening now and what's going to happen in the future. And some of you probably recognize, or do any of you recognize Tio Rocky? No? Nobody recognizes Tio Rocky. Okay, I'm glad nobody does. And we can move on. Now, <coughs> so I kind of coined that phrase to say it's the end of retail as we know it. So what's happening is that there's been significant changes that we've seen from Mark's presentation, what's happening with retail and retail technology. And technology is definitely changing what's happening within the retail landscape. Part of it's been driven by uh, <coughs> what happened in 2007 and the, the recession, and things have moved on dramatically since then because we need to engage the customers, consumer confidence is down, consumers are not as willing to spend as they were previously. We look at the ESRI, the KBC, uh, the Consumer Confidence Index, and you know what, it's, uh, it's, it's moving up slightly, but it's still down significantly from its height. We got high oil, pr oil, oil prices, Eurozone is definitely not out of crisis. Um, you know, we could s soon see that something may happen again with maybe Portugal or Spain or possibly Italy or even possibly Ireland again. The USA, we've seen uh, what happened there in the last 17 days. They have 16.7 trillion debt and China's growth is slowing. So that doesn't bode well for the future economy if we look at it in a pessimistic way. So the global recession may last another five years before we come out of it. So there are challenges there for the retailers. Looking at some recent retail trends, um, <coughs> the demise of the corner shop. I don't know if any of you recognize that picture. Um, I came across it on the internet, but um, I know one might be old enough to say it's from Coronation Street, is it? <laughs> the corner shop in Coronation Street, which is gone. Now we have, what's happened here, we have uh, store closures. Right, recent store closures from Marks and Spencers, X Division is gone, HMV is gone as well, and on the top we have Pizza Parnell, which came back for a brief uh, period and then it's gone again. What we have now we see is the examinerships, uh, receiverships and examinership. Aware over the last three years has had two receiverships and one examinership. B and Q has been in examinership, Home Base, Pamela Scott, Atlantic. There are many of the stores have gone into examinerships, and we can see that the government is looking at uh, bringing out cheaper or options for stores to go into an examinership at a cheaper rate. And a lot of that is driven by the high rents. The, what's happening within the grocery sector? We've got Tesco, Super Value, Dunn stores who own over 80% of the market, and on the bottom right, that's all that's left to Superquin, just the sausages. So, um, so what's going to happen with the future of the retail store? Right? The future of the large-scale grocery, which is a significant impact on us because they do control 80% plus of the market, those three companies. And that's very, very significant when you look at retail technologies, when you look at interaction with consumers, <coughs> and when you look at the rollout of um, goods, products, and customer engagement. They control a lot of what's happening within the, within the Irish retail sector, and it's around 9 billion for that market. This is what's happening in the UK. This is an online uh, pick and pack area in Ocado. And if you're familiar with Ocado, Ocado do online, specifically online, and they buy their product from Waitrose. They also have signed up recently with a deal with Morrison to deliver their product, which didn't go down too well with Waitrose at the time. They're suggesting that by 2030, they now have two con consumer fulfillment centers, as they call them. So basically, a fulfillment is from the time you order until the time the order is complete and it arrives at your doorstep. They have 24 consumer fulfillment centers by 2030 and a 15 billion revenue. Now, when you consider that the Irish market is 9 billion at the moment, that's quite significant. And that's the way the retail landscape is changing in the UK. As at the moment, have 5,000 collection points in the UK. So you can buy online, so you click 
and you can collect in 5,000 different locations. As they will tell you, you're no more than 20 miles anywhere in the UK from one of their collection points. And one of the problems with uh, the online shopping is the delivery, that last mile, getting the product the last mile. So if you can get the consumers to come to some collection point, it makes it a lot easier, a lot more efficient. Plus if they are, or do include the Asda stores, you get them to buy more product as well, possibly. They've also brought out in York the first drive-through. So you click and then you collect, and you collect as a drive-through. So you arrive, you speak into the little device and it says, I'm um, uh, customer so-and-so, scan your card and pull into a bay and your product arrives out. And the whole process only takes five minutes. Now, what's going to happen to the local store, the local high street, the demise of the high street that we've seen? We've seen Mary Porter's review in the UK, Bill Grimsey's report over the last few weeks talking about changes and wants, he's suggesting it should be a hub. A community hub should be the, uh, um, the, what we're doing with the high streets now. But here's something interesting in the way we can use technologies and the way that the, I would suggest that the high street, you know, it's not dead to me and people want to shop on the high street and I don't mean just the Grafton streets but the local high streets in your local uh, uh, towns and villages. This is a UK company, you can see Ocado in the background. Okay, so this is happening in the UK in various towns. You can obviously see there it's not competing with the likes of Tesco or Ocado. It's not competing with Aldi or Lidl. You saw that butcher there in the fine cuts of meat. The fish, everything is a little bit more expensive. The consumers are obviously willing to pay for that. Uh, and we can see that that driver is the most happiest guy I've ever seen working as a driver around, around London. But you can see the way the, it's advertised and the way it's marketed. And they're using in local towns, you, you, from the website, six to eight stores in local villages. And it drives local 
obviously local business, but employment as well within the area. And people want to do that more and more, you know, buy local, shop local. Okay, just uh, a little slide here on uh, the indicators of retail health. If you kind of notice demand, margin, and cost, really we're looking at uh, what basically a, a miniaturized profit and loss account. Demand being your sales, margin being your gross margin, and then your expenses or your costs associated with that. So we can see at the moment that demand is depressed, the loss of confidence that we mentioned, there's a lack of credit, right? Even though there's a lot of savings in the, in the country, there's a lack of credit for people who do want to spend. Uh, margins are down, we're doing more and more promotions, whether they're effective or not, but the retailers are doing more and more promotions, which is affecting their margin. And costs, costs have been increasing over the last number of years, insurance costs particularly, fuel costs and rates. Rents and labour costs, would, people would suggest, have probably come down slightly over those periods where they've renegotiated rents over, uh, some companies have renegotiated rents as we've seen. What's happening here, this is kind of a, uh, I won't say more of an academic slide, but what's happening is if you look at the dotted line, this is the way we used to operate on a bell-shaped curve. Everybody looking for the big bit in the middle at the top there. So everybody wanted to be in that market. What's happening now more since the recession is that the market has become polarized. So on one side, we have the low cost providers. So we've got in the food, we've got the Tesco's, we've got Lidl, we've got Aldi, probably. And if I said to you low cost clothing, you're going to talk about Penny's Primark range. So they're destination stores. And on the other side, what we're moving towards is polarization. As we said, you saw the last video from Hubbub. It's niche market, so we're looking at our local fishmonger, we're looking, looking at the local butchers, we're looking at the, the local bakeries and so on, where we want to get good produce, where they specialize in these areas and you get better customer service. What's happening is, what we now have is a well-shaped curve. So we've polarized the markets, so the blue curve there represents the well-shaped the well curve. And within the middle, you don't want to be caught in the middle. Retailers have been caught in the middle recently, Woolworths in the UK, uh, did a lot of everything but never specialized in anything. You take here, I would probably say that Superquin since the recession never really found what their identity was. They never found themselves, they lost that kind of upmarket, uh, better quality and a better service. They cut down on service, the quality wasn't as good and they moved into that middle and they were bought over by uh, super value. I would, don't want to suggest, but I mean, I would probably suggest myself, is my own opinion, is that maybe Dunn stores are falling into that at the moment. You see the way they're offering discounts. For every 50 euro you spend at the moment, you get 10 euro back. I've never seen supermarkets before give discounts. It's a sale. They're having sales every week coming up to Christmas to try and encourage people to come in to keep the loyalty, to keep market share, which is particularly important for them. So, just to summarize that, customers are vacating the middle. The more selective where they shop, the shopping fewer times because we have more time constraints, the more sensitive to the price, and we're more demanding because we have more availability of technology, and we have more information available to us. And retailers say, you know what, we're doing pretty good, but I would suggest that pretty good is just not good enough anymore. We've got to up the game because of changes in technology that are happening very, very quickly, and I'm going to address those now. So the future is about retail analytics. We're in the era of big data and the science of retail, as it's been called. Just an example there, Walmart has more than one million customer transactions every hour. Huge amount. They have a database of petabytes. Now, some of you probably know that. I'm, I know it's 10 to the power of 15. So it's a lot of, you know, it's a thousand terabytes. Um, but that's a lot of data. And they suggest you know, that uh, Walmart is the biggest database in the world and they have more information on customers in the States or the citizens of the United States than the CIA and the FBI together. Okay. So Walmart creates more data per hour than research surveys have ever delivered and the storage capacity worldwide is doubling every year and there's no constraints in the amount of information that we've got now to analyze. And that's the issue, is being able to use that big data. So big data can't speak for itself no more than smaller data. So what we need to do is be able to use it. 90% of the world's data was created in the last two years. So what do we do with it? Previously we were looking for data. In the early 2000s up to the mid 2000s, 
How do I get data to analyze? How do I get data to customer data, consumer data, market data? But now we've got all the data we need. Now it's about analyzing it, cutting the information into the, the requirements that we, the, sorry, into our requirements. Here's the data, huge amounts of data. So we're moving from being creators of data into the curators of data, where we need to do the analytics. Online and offline analytics. Uh, Mark spoke about that earlier. It's a lot easier to do it online. A lot of companies don't do it well. A lot of companies don't have very good websites that match the seamless integration, as they call it. But it doesn't happen on a lot of websites, is that you get that seamless integration between the online and the offline. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to play a video here from Google. This guy is shopping online. Right? It's a visualization. A bit of volume. Can you hear that? No? I'll just stop that. I'll see if I can. Sorry. Can I get volume on this? Does anyone? No? Sorry. I need my glasses for that. Sorry about that. Did you hear it? Is it up? Full volume already. Okay. It's on full volume. So, I'll just go back a slide. Now, okay. So <clears throat> it's obviously an advertisement or it's very well put together and very well done for Google Analytics. But it does show online, when people go online, identify themselves, the information that you get about the consumer, how far they travel in the shopping trip and where they might check out is when they get to a checkout. And retailers online don't seem to realize is that they, they get web designers to design the pages, but they actually forget that people are shopping on it. And then when you get to the checkout bit, and then it suddenly becomes complicated again, you have to sign in again, give in details, more details. Amazon have it sussed one click. You're in, and it's done. And you know what? You've bought it even before you realize you've actually bought it. Everything is done. So a lot of retailers don't use that properly. Um, and that's why I, I would think that if you use Google Analytics, you get a better idea of what's happening within your, within your online business. So omni-channel is the holy grail, but uh, not according to Mark, so I'm <laughs> going to skip through that slide very quickly. <laughs> right. We live in a, or exist in a multi-screen world, so we're on 
the laptop, tablets, TV, phone. You know, 79% of people who are watching TV are using another device at the same time. BBC want to introduce a set-top box that has product placement. So when something in product placement comes up, you can click on it and it comes up on your little box and you can buy it straight away. This is Peapod, similar to Ocado in the, U in the US, in New York. And they've got a virtual van, uh, sorry, their, their truck. They have a virtual shopping wall on the side of the truck. Something similar to what Mark spoke about when you come back from your holidays and you have the virtual wall with the products on it. And you're able to click and scan and the products will arrive when you get home from your, from your holidays and you drive down the M25 or whatever. Other technologies that are happening, this one is really interesting, so how you can, you can leverage the, the use of new technologies. This one is augmented reality, if you're familiar with it, and I'm going to play this one, it's from Ikea. So this is the new Ikea catalogue, you scan the page and place it where you want the product. Well, wow, this really, I find that really powerful, you know, because I was at home yesterday and my wife brought home three pieces of carpet to look to see what we put on the bedroom. And you can't decide. And you know what, I'm just kind of thinking that IKEA catalog or whatever, if you want to see what something likes in your home, you can actually visualize it and actually see what it looks like on your iPad. So you have a very good idea before you go shopping what you want and what you might want to buy. So you're going destination shopping, buying something, because you've done that information search prior to going, to going shopping. I think that's really powerful. And that's in the, on the, the catalogs now out from Ikea. You just scan the page in, put it on the ground, and it picks up the, uh, the image from, the, from your iPad, and you can change the color and so on. I know they've made it look very sophisticated and easy to do there. It's probably not as easy to do in real life. Now, we're moving into kind of social commerce. Right, we've talked a little bit about e-commerce there, online and offline. We're moving into selling uh, on Facebook and selling with Facebook. So selling on Facebook, by, uh, you can get deals, you can buy tokens, you can pay through Facebook, and we can also sell using Facebook by links to our sites and uh, likes on the site. For example, here we've got Disney. You see on the bottom right, they've already got 45 million likes. 45 million people who get an email or a, a message on Facebook every day from Disney. And what you can do is, you can go online and go onto your Facebook page and buy uh, your Disney movie or buy it th uh, through uh, different cinemas. You can uh, buy your tickets uh, for the cinema. Now, this is in Brazil. This is CNA in Brazil. It's called, it's again from Facebook, Fashion Like. So you see the counters there. This one here has 1,059 Facebook likes, updated. Uh, automatically, in, sorry, updated in real time. So voting with their virtual thumbs. So you can then say, you know what, this is what's trending, this is what people like, I'm going to buy one of those. Or you could say, you know what, I don't want to have what everybody else has, so you buy one that has uh, less Facebook likes on it. But again, it's on, it's real time, and it's, and it's live. Here's uh, tweet commerce, or t-commerce as they're calling it, and that's fairly recent. We see with, they're looking with the IPO for, for Twitter and they need a commercialization and to be able to build advertising revenue and commercial revenue. 
That's, uh, it was interesting, if you were at the Dublin Web Summit a couple of years ago, about two years ago nearly now, Electric Ireland had a little tweet cafe on it. Uh, last month or two months ago, Twitter appointed Nathan Hubbard, who's the ex-CEO of Ticketmaster, as head of commerce. So they're really engaging with it going forward. I hate that phrase, sorry. Take that phrase back, sorry. <laughs> right. Um, here is a Twitter campaign that was launched by um, by Mercedes in China. They sold 666 cars in eight hours with a three-point Twitter commerce plan. And that's 4% of all the annual sales of smart cars done in eight hours. And how did they do it? If we look at the social commerce model, they created a special limited edition of 666 cars. Right. So it was a Twitter exclusive as well. So you had to be registered on Twitter to be able to avail of the offer. The theme and the schedule, uh, sorry, theme and schedule the special edition around a popular calendar event. They did it around the launch of the Chinese New Year. They didn't ask for full payment, just a small deposit to de-risk the purchase. But they're all sold in eight, uh, within eight hours. So you can see the potential impact if you're achieving or hitting the right audience with these uh, social commerce models. Now I think one of the problems with the Facebook model and the, the Twitter model is that they really haven't found what works yet. Uh, similar to Groupon and this collective buying model that they're using. So I don't think they found who their target audience is and I don't think they found maybe the right deals going, well, let me say that again, right, the right deals for the future. Now mobile commerce, mobile commerce people would suggest is electronic commerce done on the mobile. Uh, as Mark was saying earlier, or suggesting earlier, that's really not the case because we use our mobile phones for a lot more than just uh, buying stuff. We can actually search for stuff as well. Now, really is just uh, <coughs> the next step in the evolution of commerce. So we'd barter all the way down to credit cards. The first e-commerce transaction was completed in 1994, less than 20 years ago. And the first mobile commerce was completed in 1977. So what is mobile commerce? It's e-commerce, it's electronic commerce, but it has all of these added features. Location-based services. We know where you are. If you want to give us access to your phone and to your uh, location, we know where you are. We can make personalized offers. We have voice control, so we've got, it's going to become that Siri in the future. That technology is going to become better and better, so we're going to be able to interact with consumers a lot easier. We've obviously got the camera where we can scan, QR codes, always connected, completely available. So that's what M commerce is, a mobile commerce. And uh, as Mark said, you know, we're looking at, say, drivers here, and I'll come to a, a slide here, but about um, by 2020, 80% of the times we go online will be done on our mobile phone. 90% of smartphone shoppers use it for pre-shopping activity. I think Mark suggested that in his previous presentation. And what are they doing most? Looking for location, looking for directions to your store, looking for your opening hours, and then price comparisons. So your website will need to have those. Sometimes I go online and you want to find where the location of something is, and you can't find it on, the, on a drop-down menu. But that's the first thing people are looking for. Why it is it the last thing they think that you need to look for on their website? Because they want to have all their nice glossy products and so on on it. But they don't, this is what I go on for. I go on to find where it is and the hours of opening. And sometimes websites are very difficult to find. 80%, sorry, 84% of smart shoppers use the device while they're in a store. Okay. Now this is uh, from a survey done in the, quite an extensive survey done in the US. Shoppers who use the mobile in store buy more. And in these categories, health and beauty is 50%, appliances 40% plus, electronics and household are up 25%. The blue line is standards and the frequent smart, uh, smartphone shoppers is in the green there. In-store comparisons are the most common shopping activity across all the category ranges. 74% in appliances and 70%, so it's, it, it's, it's big all the way through in all the different categories. Even in grocery there are 36%. Compound annual growth rate, it's uh, smartphone data traffic. We can see there it's exponential and we can see that uh, smartphones account for 50% or will account for 50% of total global data traffic by 2016 and as I said 
80% of uh, uh, internet connections by 2020. So we can't get away from it. I'm going to skip through that and I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening within digital couponing. Uh, I know Mark mentioned it in his presentation and I'm just going to have a... This is the last one. Now, so again, we're looking at couponing, digital couponing, having all your loyalty cards on your phone. And basically, there's a company in, in Ireland called Zappa, um, a kind of a, a new Zappa, not the original one with John Nagel, but a, a new company called, I think it's Zappa.com. And basically, they're doing that on digital couponing. And basically, your information is held in the cloud. And when you go into a store and you use the NFC technology and you tap your, your uh, phone, then it accesses your, your uh, little cloud, and basically they can send personalized offers down to you as they wish. Okay, so we're back to um, this, the last couple of slides. So Theo Rauqui, uh, the end of retail as we know it. What I'm suggesting is that the winning retailers, of course we're going to have casualties in retail, but winning retailers will embrace technology. They'll engage with shoppers. In an omni-channel world, I better say that, quietly, Mark. So in an omni-channel world with or through mobile devices, I think the, the main thing there, and I agree with Mark, but I mean, it's, it's engaging with the customers. Okay? So retailers ask, how do we sell more? But really, retailers should be asking, or you should be saying to retailers, you know what, how do I get the shoppers? How do I get my shoppers to spend more? And as we said, one of the areas which is difficult for uh, consumers, or sorry, for retailers, is actually that conversion rate. As Mark referred to in the hardware store, you get three people in and only one person buys. Now, my solution is to just very simple, you make the shopper happy. How do you make the shopper happy? You give them what they want. If you go to a supermarket, you've got 15,000 SKUs. 
the average household or the average consumer is buying 300 of those a year. So he or she is wasting 80% of their time in the supermarket walking around past products that they don't want. Okay, so you want to give them what they want. Secondly, support shoppers in store and at the shelf. If they know what they want, you make it easy for them to find it. Not difficult. And if they don't know what they want, then we can use methods and techniques for point of sale, point of pop, and we can use those techniques to actually influence people who haven't made up their mind. And lastly, this may sound counterintuitive, is that make it as quick as possible. You want to get, people want to go in, they don't want to spend their time in stores. What they want to do is get in, find the products that they want, and then they want to leave. And if they have a, a successful shopping trip and they're happy, they spend more. And on top of that, the research will show you that they become loyal customers. That's me done. Thank you very much.